welcome everybody and i really like those people who are always on time and thanks sanjay thanks dr alok thanks dr visalam sushma uh, and everybody who has joined us on time to talk about this interesting and very very innovative topic as dr thomas was sharing with me you know just before we started uh, that Okay, Rohit, please mute yourself. Perfect. That peptides is one area which is growing at a phenomenal rate, and I really like the title which Dr. Thomas has put here: "Working with Nature, Not Trying to Outsmart It or Fight It." Uh, Dr. Thomas comes from a very, very rich background. Actually, when I was introduced to him, and thanks, Dr. Vesalam, for introducing him. and you know helping us uh, learn from him um, he comes from a psychology background so he understand human beings and human potential to the core he is a medical doctor he is certified in anything and everything which we do in functional medicine and has huge success rate in working with cancer patients in addition to the other patients he deals with and when i was speaking to dr thomas he shared that you know peptides are his area which is very passionate about teaching because he feels and he has seen that that it's a very very safe therapy to do and it can benefit lots of people from doing anti aging to you know better sexual life to looking young and also helping people reverse or manage cancer better so dr thomas without wasting any more time i am going to hand it over to you we are very very excited to learn from you on peptides and implement in our practice over to you dr thomas very nice thank you thank you very much um <coughs> i <clears throat> about about 4 or 5 days ago I got really sick and I haven't been sick and last time I was sick was about 30 years ago with uh well I got the flu nowadays I think I think they call it other things I think they 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 think it's this visitor from the planet omicron and then they also think it's uh it's other things so anyway whatever they're calling it nowadays it's it's just the flu so anyway <clears throat> and but according to the statistics I should be dead since I'm 70 Should I be dead? Well, this is day four, and I'm here, more energy than ever. So, wow. Anyway, so here I am, and so what I tried to do just today, because and then my computer didn't work. I mean, the internet went down, so I had a big problem here getting getting this done. So this might be a little scrambled. Please forgive me. Um, and I certainly can't cover everything because there is uh, the, the the field of peptides is exploding. it's exploding in every area whatever your area is you're going to see that i'm just going to i'm going to give you little bits of it so uh and i'm not going to try not to go into things too too deeply so let me just okay now remember this this is for just non physicians as well as physicians anyway you all know amino acids and you all know that there are 20 amino acids right you know that and you know that there are essential amino acids that we must get in our diet um and then you uh, are probably told by um most of the people that um you have to eat dead animals if you want to get all your protein you know that's what they would tell me in texas if i was in texas um so it turns out that even mushrooms give me all the essential amino acids fruits vegetables nuts grains legumes give me all the essential and non-essential sorry but every time i talk to people i have to throw in the fact that just because i want to eat it doesn't have to mean that someone must die so here's some more complete proteins wow more wow wow okay now peptide bond is really it's a dehydration bond okay to amino acids the water is removed and you've got a peptide bond okay peptides and proteins i mean this is the, the definition 
with these is extremely arbitrary. Uh, in fact, no man's land is between 50 and 100. So anything under 50 is definitely a peptide and anything over 100 is definitely a protein. So they never clarify anywhere what is with what 50 to 100 is. But most of the peptides that are found in the human body are around 20. Okay, the names of peptides, and you all know this, um, it's just basic uh, um, Greek, no, Latin, hexa, 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 octa. Now, um, the types and actions of peptides. So just to give you an idea of the variety, you have antibiotic peptides and others. Our body produces these peptides as um, to, to inter interfere with bacteria and, um, uh, and funguses and other microorganisms from uh, colonizing a particular area. Okay, so we've got that within us. We have bacterial peptides, <laughs> brain peptides, cancer, anti-cancer peptides, cardiovascular peptides. Endocrine, fungal, venom, vaccine, respiratory. Anyway, as you can see, it's an extremely broad field. Um, but just to, to have an understanding of the basic function of peptides is that peptides are basically uh, ways in which the cell, the body communicates. You know, you, fi you figure we have anywhere from sixty to one hundred trillion cells in our body, and they're all working as one unit. I mean, we have one, and the, in the end, all these, right? And you, you have all looked into the biochemistry, right? The biochemistry that occurs in one organelle, in one cell, is mind-blowing, okay? So to imagine this whole thing working together and coming out with me, with you, right? Okay, so who's running the show? Well, we all know who's running the show. That's, of course, um, uh, Divin divinity, we are divine beings, um, but um, the way in which these cells communicate with each other so that they can function like that is also divine, and we have what are called hormones. As you know, we have a central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, and these are pretty much the main ways in which the, the body communicates with, the, with itself, um, and um, so, and, and as you know, hormones, there's steroid hormones, and there's peptide hormones, so basically the whole, these peptides are, are signaling molecules. They, they, they land on a cell and they signal. So just to show you some of the, the, the peptide hormones, I mean, the peptide hormones that we're already aware of are these. And we're, we're all familiar with these, insulin, leptin, oxytocin. I will make these slides available so if you all want to, so you don't have to uh, take notes or anything, you can just enjoy the show. Um, but anyway, as you can see, yeah, these are, Now, in our, the human body produces about 30,000 proteins and about 293,000 peptides. It's interesting, the human genome contains 20,000 genes, about 1.2% of the total genome. That means the other 98.8% is what we call, used to call junk DNA. There's the arrogance, the audacity of the human to think that God would make anything junk. God doesn't make junk and he doesn't make whipped cream. He only makes things, or he, she, it, it only produces things that are necessary. The law of the universe, as we know, is not a moral universe. It's a necessary universe. Everything that happens, happens out of necessity. So you know, you, you can stop asking the question, why? Well, why did this happen? It's necessary. I don't understand it, but it's necessary. So anyway, how hep peptides work. Okay, they land on the receptor of a cell, and some go, some are go right in and have their action directly in the nucleus. Others land on it and stimulate a process, with which just should be well known to you is the, the G protein coupled receptors. Um, there are over a thousand different types of these receptors, and this was the Nobel 12, 2012 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Um, but anyway. So when a peptide hormone binds to the receptor, it activates the G protein, right? And then which triggers a cellular response. So basically, just to remind us that the, these pro, the, the, and the beauty of using peptides is that you're using substances that occur naturally in the, in the body so that 
the cells, the, our cells are going to recognize them and, uh, and we're going to have receptors for them. So it's kind of like, now, can you do too much? Yeah, you can definitely overdose on insulin. We know that, we know that. So you could do too much, right? So, but, but basically what we want to keep in mind is that um, uh, for the most part, like, for example, if you had too much insulin, which is a peptide, by the way, if you had too much insulin, um, <coughs> if you could tolerate the effects for a while, if, you, if someone could keep your blood sugar up for a while, you would be fine. The extra insulin will be broken down into amino acids. So the, 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 the um, and all of these peptorn, peptide medicines that we're going to talk about uh, um, really have no serious adverse effects, none of them. And you'll see that when we look at side effect profiles. So the history of it, uh, this is interesting, it must be interesting to you guys. In 326, uh, Indian soldiers used arrows dipped in Russell's, Russell's Viper against Alexander the Great. They didn't like that at all. This was the first medical use of a venom being used in 37 BC when Mithridates was bleeding to death and uh, the, uh, his, his neighborhood uh, battlefield physician was there. And of course, if he didn't save his life, he'd be dead. So he had to make sure he did. Uh, so he, he was an out of the box thinker. He said, well, let me get some venom of this venom because what does this venom do? It causes the whole body to coagulate. So let me just put that right in his leg. And of course it was healed. It stopped bleeding. So anyway, the venoms from snakes, snakes, toads, scorpions, spiders have been used for millennia, okay? Um, won't go here in 1970 angiotensin inhibitor of captopril was developed based on bradykinin potentiating peptides etc okay now insulin was the first peptide hormone discovered in 1921 and as you know that i'm not sure if you know there was some um, controversy about the, the the nobel prize uh it was supposed to go to two people that only went to one uh which was really sad it was really sad because uh shouldn't happen um so anyway it's considered a peptide with 51 amino acids it's got an alpha chain and a beta chain okay yeah they ignored best hey i'm not sure what the stuff i what the politics was behind that Sorry, that was noisy. I apologize. Um, so now peptides are one of the newest big things in medical research. I was talking about that before in, in therapeutics. Uh, they're natural. They're, they're, they're usually very specific because they have a, they have a receptor. So they have, they have a specific response. It's not like uh, these new targeting um, uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies that are used in what they're calling uh, oncoimmunology. Um, it's, it's not immunology at all. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fancy word for uh, chemotherapy. It's a fancy word for, uh, for poisoning people um, because it's not something that occurs naturally. Therefore, it, is it going to have side effects? Those are not side effects. Those are effects. Yeah. So those are the effects. Um, but anyway, with this, you know, you know what you're going to get. You got to, like, you give insulin, you know what's going to happen. So anyway, these are they're more they're more potent. They're safe for the most part. You know, insulin overdosing is not safe. Whoops. Um, and when it breaks down, as I said, you just add to your amino acid pool. Okay. Um, now these these uh, peptides that we that are produced, uh, and you'll see how they're produced, um, mimic the uh, behavior of the natural ligand, the the natural signal. Um, it interacts with the receptor on an enzyme or a cell to produce a biological effect. Therefore, it's precise. It doesn't have side effects. There's no unexpected effect. The only effects that we ever see from peptides are maybe um, you know, flushing or warm, warm, or uh, maybe some of them are painful when they get injected, and I avoid those.
Anyway, the early pe peptides in the early part of the century, oxytocin, nine amino acids, vasopressin, nine amino acids, amazing. The, imagine, it's only just nine amino acids. We're talking about very small. Um, now, science finally approved, after a thousand years, the FDA approved the use of leeches in 2004. And so leeches, <coughs> leeches help heal wounds and restore circulation in blocked veins. Um, it's amazing that we have to have the FDA approve such a thing. You know, I deal with cancer all the time, and I've had women uh, 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 who have come in with uh, breast tumors that were so large and necrotic. I mean, they it kind of looked like cauliflower. I'm not sure if you've ever seen that, but it's it had that kind of uh, you know, and this is a, usually uh, it's, it's, it's an inflammatory breast cancer, but it can even be uh, just a, a, another, a non-inflammatory that breaks through the skin and just grows. Anyway, all the outside becomes necrotic. And the, 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 the smell is, you can't tolerate it. You know, and you wonder how, when I meet these people and they come in for the first time, and you wonder how could they have lived with it for, and, and let it get that far. But they do, people are afraid and they live with it. So uh, what did we use? How can you get rid of necrotic tissue and not damage healthy tissue? Again, call on God. God gave us these beautiful little creatures called maggots. So it's called medical maggot therapy. You put the maggots on, you cover them with cellophane, and you wait about two or three days, and then you let the flies fly. And when the flies go, you've got nothing left but um, beautiful pink skin. Um, um, dirt, you know, under, underlying uh, tissue. And by the way, I don't think I don't think the FDA has approved maggots yet, so be careful. Science is always harnessing nature. So here you've got eight drugs, FDA approved drugs from the Gila monster, peptide hormones. Okay, now this one here I like a lot. Um, this is from the Death Sucker Scorpion. It's thirty six amino acids. It specifically binds to glioma cells, glioma cells. So what's really um, important is in surgery, if you're trying to um, identify which cells are, are, um, are, are malignant and which are not, and you're a neurosurgeon and you've already got your specs on and you're looking very, very tightly, you, you, if, you have, if you have used this, this chlorotoxin, what happens is it only binds to the abnormal cells. It's like it paints it. So, but it also, so now the surgeon can easily remove what's, what, what, it, what he needs, he or she needs to remove. Um, uh, but also when it, the binding of this substance also prevents its growth. <coughs> this is old. I can't remember the number now. But as you can see, in 2018, there were 60 peptide drugs approved in US, Europe, and Japan, over 150 in active clinical development, and 260 have been tested in human clinical trials. Uh, and here, this is just uh, important to notice is that if you look across the decades, you'll see that most of the peptides being researched in, um, and, and obviously uh, brought to market are the ones that are the under 10 amino acids. So, summary. Naturally occurring bioregulatory chemicals that control hormone, cell to cell communication, cell signal, less than 50 amino acids, natural, bioidentical, or altered, right? They, can, they do alter them, um, but it's okay. You're still coming up with um, um, amino acid uh, peptides. So almost 300,000 in the body and over 7,000 in clinical use at this point. So addresses immunity, inflammation, chronic illnesses, sleep, sexuality, reproduction, and aging. And, 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 and. Uh, so anyway, these are not all the peptides that will be discussed. I didn't, I didn't include a couple of these, and I think I include a couple that are, that are not in here. And, and, and you'll see, it just takes a long time. So. Um, just, uh, this is one of my favorite is, um, is, um, produced by the, uh, pineal gland epithalamin. So 
So here it is, it weighs less than 0.2 grams and uh, accumulates fluoride, calcium, and phosphorus crystals, right? That accumulate with age and with you, whoops, and with those who use, if you have a, a government that uh, puts fluoridate, fluoride in the water or you have, you're buying fluoridated toothpaste, then you're in trouble. Or if you go to a dentist that uses fluoride, then you're in trouble. But anyway, it's a photosensitive timekeeper for the human body. It produces about 30 micrograms of melatonin a day in sighted people, not in people that are blind. People that are blind have much more melatonin production and much less cancer. Um, anyway, it also, uh, you know, melatonin regulates circadian rhythm, et cetera. Uh, it also, the, the pineal gland also produces a dimethyltryptamine, which is also known as ayahuasca, uh, and it's produced neocortex and hypothalamus. It's, it's where it has its effect. And uh, we, we, won't, we won't go into the DMT, but the other thing is this four amino acid peptide called epithalamin, also called epithalamin. Okay, a potent biological regulator uh, peptide involved in growth, puberty, fertility, immunity, and aging. It, it actually oversees the management of the pineal gland. Okay, it, it, it will increase melatonin production. It is an antioxidant, okay? It inhibits the formation and growth of cancer and it elongates telomeres by 33%. I'll show you the study in a minute. Attenuates inflammation, regulates endocrine activity in the body, combats the negative effects of stress and regulates pineal secretions, okay? So, and so, so that you can see if someone um, wanted to make us vulnerable, uh, other than feeding us fast food and, uh, and lies, uh, they would probably do everything they could to uh, damage our pineal gland. So now this is also called epithalon, epithalon, right? So epithalamin stimulates telomerase, increases telomer length by 33%, okay? Now this is a Russian, a Russian researcher who found this out. And by the way, a friend of mine got in touch with him and said, hey, you never mentioned in any of your research um, how long you can use this for. And he said, well, when I first discovered it and first started working with it back, uh, I think, I don't know, I forget the year, but he said when my, my mother was um, 60, um, I've been giving it to her twice a year now. Um, she's now in her late 80s, and she looks the same as to me as she did when I started working with her. So here's a study with um, uh, that he did, uh, and they did epithalamin increases lifespan of mice and rats to the equivalent of 100.7 human years without the development of, of, of cancer. But that's a very important uh, point because usually when the longer you live, the more likelihood you're gonna get cancer, okay? So elderly with heart disease, a 15 year study, 79 participants aged 60 to 69. So the group one standard care with epithalamin um, twice a year for three years. Group two standard care, okay? Now 10 milligrams IM every three days times five days, right? So that was it, okay? You do this every six months. You don't need to do it more than that. What they found was that the epithalamin group, cardiovascular deaths, 46.2% as opposed to 83 in the control group. Survival, 66.7 compared to 40% in the control group. And you gotta understand that these were people that ate pretty bad food, like, like most people do. They probably stayed up late. They probably didn't move around a lot. I mean, so, all they did was to um, give them epithalamin. And by the way, these are very easy to use. You get little vials, you, you uh, uh, re, uh, reconstitute it with sterile water, and then you take out the amount you need with an insulin syringe, 31 needle, I mean, uh, and then you just grab a piece of your belly or your thigh and you inject it. Um, now, but several are, <coughs> there's a few orals that are available. And uh, there's even more nasal, which are nice, the intranasal sprays. And then the rest are the injections, but the injections are no big deal unless it happens to be one that is painful. Okay, 
So get rid of 10 milligrams and two milliliter. I had saline here, but it's not, it's good. What I found is that they say saline or sterile water. But what I have found is that a lot of times if I use saline, um, it'll precipitate and you can't use it. So sterile water always prevents that. So optional dosing is, yeah. So there's different ways you can do it. Uh, if anyone's in, by the way, I, I just want you all to know that um, um, we're lucky because there's a, there's a company called TaylorMade uh, and I, I'm not the expert on, 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 on these at all. Uh, in fact, the guy that is, a, that is an expert um, is uh, somebody I would like to bring on uh, one time and have him give a lecture, or not one time, as many times as he'll be willing. Uh, I've never met anyone more, know more about peptides than this guy. Anyway, he's the starter. He's one of the founders of, uh, co-founders of uh, TaylorMade. And uh, anyway, they've, the, the uh, FDA, you know, the Federal Death Authority, well, they have um, uh, made it uh, difficult for, for, for peptides to be used in the US, um, even though they have, many of them have FDA approval. And one of the reasons is, is because TA1, um, thymosin alpha-1, which we'll talk about in a little while, uh, has great effect against the uh, COVID-19. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, so for that reason, it's now very hard to get, even though I think it's improved, it's approved in what, 130 countries. It's FDA approved. It's, it was, it's, it's brand name was Zydaxin, Zydaxin. So anyway, so they're having, so what they do is they ship, like they can ship to Europe, Europe, they can ship to India, they can ship to Thailand, they can ship. So for my clinic in the U S they have to ship to me and then I ship back to them, to my clinic. So. Uh, it's just more hoops. Um, anyway, so if you're all interested, uh, at all interested, I could work out an arrangement where we could find out uh, maybe one of you could become um, who's interested in doing doing taking over the business. But um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Thomas, we already have question regarding this. Where to source it from? And is it legal to use in India? Well, okay, so epithalon... Epithalon? Yeah, or maybe peptides. Well, no, well, peptides, they're all different. So they're, 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 you know, um, it was in 19, um, I forget what the year was, 1962, I think, was when they, uh, they uh, finally came up with a way to make uh, peptides. You know, they figured out it was it's a, good, a good system for sequencing them and putting them together because they have to be produced. They have to be produced from amino acids, but that's all they are. You got keep in mind that when you're talking about a patented drug, what you've done is you've taken a natural substance and you've added something to it that's not natural, and now you can patent it. Okay, you cannot patent peptides because they're just what they are, unless you've modified the peptide from as natural. So the you'll see FOXO4, FOXO4DRI is modified. So it can be, it can be a, um, 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 for, to be a patented, right? Right. So, uh, so these are what I'm saying is these are an, an amino acid. Is an, I mean tryptophan is tryptophan, right? Uh, and we can't patent it. Right. So, so, so they're yeah, they, they can't be patented. So they're made in a laboratory uh, because you. I, I certainly, especially nowadays, don't want to get any excretions or secretions or ex, extractions. From any human being, do you? You want to get it no. natural? Yeah, natural, definitely natural, Doctor Thomas. So, well, then you've got to get get it extracted from a human being. You, you want to go in? Do you want to do that? How many human beings do you know um, were smart enough to avoid genetic uh, engineering? Not many. Not many. Not many. So, where are you going? What, what? There's no more natural in when it comes to glandulars and things like that, and especially. Right. To get this one here, you would have to you would have to extract it from a from the pineal gland, which I'm sure would not not possible not be possible. So in this case, uh, and in many of the cases, there's they they've got well, like for example, think about it. This is only four amino acids, so you just have to make three peptide bonds, right? 
it's, it's so it's really simple. So and as I said, because they're specific and they have a receptor, they therefore have known consequences, known results. There's no surprises. That that's the beauty of it. Yeah. So here's the pineal gland, and uh, and as you, I'm sure you all know that being doctors, you all know that. But you know, here we are, early on in life, and as we get older, it, so does it, right? So here I am. So do I need epithalamin? Absolutely. Do I do it twice a year? Yes. So how do you decalcify the <coughs> pineal gland? Avoid fluoridated uh, water, use fluoride-free toothpaste, eat organic, eat organic fruits and vegetables. Uh, raw chocolate, melatonin, and epitalin, which I think are all stimulate the pineal gland. Eliminate mercury feelings and meditate. All of this has been proven to decalcify the pineal gland. Epithalon actually has a reparative effect on the pineal gland by stimulating its activity and increasing the production of melatonin. Okay, yeah, so here it is. It was 1965. 1965, scientists from China completed the synthesis of insulin, which is the first, the world's first synthetic peptide. Okay, so 1902, 1902, we got secretin, 1931, substance P, 1953, oxytocin. Uh, and then here, it was at the end of the 18, 1950s that Robert Bruce Merrifield invented solid phase peptide synthesis. Very important because now, now they were able to be produced. And that since that time, we've seen an explosion in research. Now, cerebral lysin, now I'm gonna talk about neuropeptides first. Cerebral lysin is actually a combination of nerve growth factors, um, which all come together to repair, um, repair and to recover nerve cells in the brain and, and peripheral nervous system. So they are brain-derived neurotropic factor, nerve growth factor, and keflin, orexin, CN, um, cerebral nerve, nerve growth factor, and P21, which you may know is uh, one of the signaling pathways in, in our cells. Okay, so that's what cerebralisin is. It's basically a combination of these peptides, okay? As I said, neuroprotective and neuroregenerative. It has a low molecular weight, so it can, it can cross the blood-brain barrier and the blood-CSF barrier, okay? Very important. It's a peptidergic, der, peptidergic drug with neuroprotective, neurorestorative properties. Anyway, they, some of them, some of these neuropeptides into, uh, um, demonstrate cross-reactivity with antibodies against several trophic factors, such as glial cell line, neurotrophic factor, ciliary neurotrophic factor, IGF-1 and IGF-2, suggesting their potential capacity to bind receptors of these factors. And indeed they do. It's just, this was just some, uh, in, uh, what's the word? Indirect evidence. So what it does is cerebral lysin acts as, uh, has pleiotropic positive effects on amyloid beta and tau pathologies, neuroinflammation, neurotrophic factors, oxidative stress, excitotoxicity, neurotransmission, brain metabolism, neuronal apoptosis, degeneration, neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, as well as cognition. Now, and this has been shown in human studies. So what, what is amazing about this now is that I have there's a there's a doctor named Pam Smith um, in the U.S. who pretty much specializes in this all the neurological peptides, uh, and she's pretty much like a, a, a maestro with it. But she she is a, it takes it takes a good year, but she can really reverse people uh, many people not everyone uh, who have traumatic brain injury, which you know is a serious situation. Okay, so again, in pharma and pharma pharmacodynamic studies, it's been shown that it reduces brain amyloid beta deposition, tau phosphorylation, and amyloid beta and tau related neuropathologies. Okay, modulates neuroinflammation, etc. Um, uh, reducing elevated serum TNF alpha TNF receptor. Anyway, I won't go into all of these details. Protects against oxidative and exotoxic damage. One of the most important things about this and the CMAX and the C-length that I'm gonna talk about is that 
in addition to restoring, repairing, uh, and stimulating, nootropic, stimulating their growth, they also chelate and they also get rid of, uh, they're also uh, neurological antioxidants. So in even uh, the person who is <coughs> aging, and let's say you're 55, you're 60 years old, your memory is not what it was. Start on it. Not this one. I would start on the C-Max and the C-Link, which is what I did. By the way, just so you all know, I did. Uh, I gave myself one milligram of C-Max this morning because when I woke up, this was again day four of all this horrible flu, and I hadn't been out of bed in three days. <clears throat> so I was sitting up here looking at the computer, and I was kind of, huh? huh? I gave myself the C-Max. Here I am, eight hours later. So it's amazing. <clears throat> um, so it protects against oxidative and, and excitotoxic damage by inhibiting lipid peroxidation and calpane activation. Influences synaptic tra transmission mediated, <clears throat> mediated by GABA B, adenosine A1, and glutamate receptors. Enhances the supply of glucose to the brain and ameliorates the slowing of brain bioelectrical activity, promotes neuroplasticity, and prevents dendritic and synaptic, synaptic loss. I mean, it's, you know, these things almost sound like someone's making it up. It can't be true, but it's, this is all proven in the literature. Stimulates neurogenesis, probably through AK, AKT activation. Improves learning and memory, okay? Therapeutic uses so far, concussion, traumatic brain injury, Alzheimer's, dementia, <clears throat> strokes, Parkinson's, MS, mood disorders. Um, yeah, and I, I should add in here, I don't know why I didn't, but cognition, memory, um, very, very important. Now, we're gonna talk about uh, uh, adrenal cortical um, um, ACTH um, and, and other POMC peptides. I'm sure you're familiar with the pro opio melanocortin. You may be, it's a, um, it's a very large, I think 267 amino acid protein that's produced in the brain. And then it is cleaved and broken down into smaller ones. I'll show you in a moment. <clears throat> but anyway, ACTH, uh, the first evidence that uh, ACTH, the effect of behavior on animals was obtained in the mid fifties. At that time, David Weed, uh, and colleagues studied the influence of ACTH and its fragments on the learning abilities of animals and show that the removal of the glandular lobe of the, of the um, pituitary resulted in disturbed formation of conditioned responses that could be restored com completely with administration of ACTH. Okay, so here is the, uh, the, the propio melanocortin and its derivative. Okay, and as you can see, the beta endorphin, gamma lipotropin, alpha uh, melanostimulating hormone, which is from the a ACTH. So differential cleavage of POMC occur in different tissues where it is expressed, resulting in diverse biological functions. Yeah, so this is an amazing um, protein here and pre propio melanocortin. In fact, it exists, it's made as a pre. I think and it has, it's, we, the, an enzyme comes in and removes 12 uh, amino acids and turns it into the propio melanocortin derivative. Now let's talk about CMAX because this is what, this is the area. So in the late 1970s, a research team headed by Dr. Um, Maya Sadov and Ashmarin, they initiated study, studies to produce a nootropic peptide preparation based on ACTH because they had seen that when they took out the pituitary gland of, of, of these rats, they were able to restore the function with the ACTH, of the, the cognitive function. The problem is that the, the, the effects produced shortness of breath. So they, had, they, had, they, were, they were limited on how, what they could use, right? And it's probably because of the effect on the adrenal glands. Um, anyway, so what they found, and then they finally came down to this fragment here, the ACTH 4 to 10 <clears throat> was as short as the effect was only 30 to 60 minutes. Okay. 
And even by increasing the dose, it had it yielded no effect. <coughs> so the study of the nootropic activity of some analogs, various C-terminal regions and modifications showed that the analogs carrying a replacement of the three terminal amino acids pro gly pro. Now this is important because it's it, it's found in other um, it's found in other peptides too, where they actually add in this three amino acid sequence, and it it it, it can um, uh, modify the activity a little bit. Okay, so anyway, this new peptide. Sorry about that. This new peptide, where am I? Ah, okay, so this, this new peptide, which um, uh, where they added the pro -gly pro, as you can see at the end there, okay, uh, was, was called CMAX, and it exhibited no tropic effects if it's natural, but its effects lasted for 20 to 24 hours. That's the important part. So it lasted 20 to 24 hours, and it did not cause any other problems associated because this is a derivative from the uh, uh, melan melanocyte stimulating hormone, alpha. Uh, because the reason you you want to avoid the the uh, whoops, you want to avoid the side effects from that, or you want to avoid the effects of that is because um, you get the corticotropic. Um, because you don't get the melanocyte stimulating activities, right? Um, as you'll see, there are there are there's another <clears throat> group of peptides from the same parent um, that make you turn extremely dark. So, um, in fact, one of them, the melanotan one, can be used with vitiligo. So, if you have any people with vitiligo, this will help restore that. So, that's a very uh, a nice effect where you wouldn't want to uh, eliminate that effect. You wouldn't want to eliminate that. So, so the CMAX, what does it do? It elevates expression of the brain-derived neurotrophic factor and it increases the TRKB, tyrosine kinase beta receptor, activates dopaminergic and serotonergic stem cells. Okay, so in the brain, you're, you're, activ you're activating the, the stem cells that produce dopamine and serotonin, okay? All very, very much important for antidepressants and anxiolytic. Attenuates chronic stress. So the biological activity of CMAX, okay, shown to increase brain-derived neurotrophic factor, nerve growth factor, tyrosine kinase B type two. Um, yeah, anyway, so this is the study. Now, so th what they did was they exposed neurons to glutamate, which, as you know, is toxic to neurons, and they improved that uh, neuronal survival by an average of 30%, okay? So as I said, anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective, remyelination and neurorestoration. <clears throat> it also chelates um, heavy metals. It also uh, it also stimulates where was it? Oh. Yeah, it also chelates heavy metals, especially copper. Um, and um, as you know, it's the copper toxicity, uh, we all know of Wilson syndrome, but uh, you can have copper toxicity. And copper toxicity, uh, if, if you're having co copper toxicity, <clears throat> Remember, it will be, it, it's the same double-edged sword as iron toxicity, right? Because both copper and iron exist as uh, in a, in a ick valence of three plus and an us valence of two plus, okay? And being in an ick condition, they're easily reduced and they produce hydrogen peroxide and other reactive oxygen species and can cause severe damage, all right? So it's very important that the CMAX actually does this, um, prevents that from happening. So 15 year experience published in 1997, significantly improved memory and attention in healthy men under extreme conditions of activity. And they were using it as intra intranasal administration. Now we have, um, when I first started working with peptides a few years ago, we only had injectable, but now many 
are, we're now getting many that are intranasal. And uh, so what do we have intranasal now? We have several of them. I'll try to mention them at, as we go through numbers, but one is CMAX. And the other one is C-Link. And the, 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 the beauty of C-Max and C-Link is since they're nootropic, they're going to go right into the nose, right through the cribriform plate, and they have direct administration uh, at, at access to the brain. Right? Which is exactly why you don't want, when going to a public place, anyone to stick an unknown substance deep into your nasal cavity with the excuse that they're testing for something. So CMAX for strokes, study of 30 patients with acute ischemic strokes. CMAX improved the recovery of the stroke clinically and by EEG. 12 milligrams for moderate, 18 milligrams. And the course was five to 10 days. Pretty amazing. Uh, CMAX clinical effects, attention and memory. The work of Kaplan et al. using uh, human volunteers showed that intranasal administration significantly increased attention and short-term memory uh, of the subjects during testing. Okay, it had a, a, a healthful effect on non-proliferating diabetic neuro, neuropathy, stroke hypoxia, glaucoma, optic neuropathy, analgesic, and opioid attenuation, and ADHD. In fact, I have a, I have an 80-year-old male here um, in Phuket who happens to be a billionaire. I thought billionaires were smart, but anyway. He's been on Ritalin for 30 years. I asked him why. He said, was it they put his son on it when his son was a teenager or something. So, there you go. Whatever that means. Um, anyway, so he's been on it now, the father. And he said, I, I don't want to take this anymore. I don't think it's good for me. I said, good thought. Let me get, so I gave him the C-Length, the C-Max, and something called Dihexa. And he's using these natural substances and just stopped a cold turkey after 30 years of, uh, of Ritalin and uh, his, his perfect attention, all that sort of thing. He's in, he's in his mid, mid to late 80s. So the method of administration is sub-Q or nasal. As you can see, it's low dose, 100 micrograms to 750 micrograms, timing as needed. Now the suggestion is um, three to 1,000 micrograms sub-Q twice a week, and you can alternate with C-Link <clears throat> so that you could be doing it four times a week. But you can also do it daily. There's no problem. The only Concern is tachyphylaxis, phylaxis, that you might, your body might become used to it. And if it does, you stop for a day or two. Okay, so C-Link. Heptapeptide, nootropic, anxiolytic, synthetic analog of the human peptide Tuftsin. Now, <coughs> C-Link has exactly the same cognitive um, benefits as CMAX, except that it is much more anxiolytic. So therefore, let's say, and, and these are good for, these are good to use. You keep the little spray bottles near your, you, you know, and you give yourself a squirt when you, you know, if you're working on a project, if you're, uh, or if you, you know, if you have patients, if you have patients who are actually losing their memory and stuff like that, I actually find that I like, I, I, I um, the effects last longer when I give myself the sub Q of the and of the CMAX. Um, but um, the uh, so the C length would be probably more indicated in the person who had an anxious cognitive decline. For example, somebody, you know, a lot of times you'll see in people with uh, with Alzheimer's early onset or other kinds of um, uh, dementias, they know that what's happening to them and it makes them extremely anxious and uncomfortable and all that sort of thing. And just that anxiety now contributes more. So now they can't think because we know, we know that one of the things that anxiety is on uh, the release of, uh, of uh, 
epinephrine and cortisol um, you know, kicks our, our consciousness away from our prefrontal cortex into our hind brain so that we can just be response mechanisms and not think. Because you know, when you got a, a guy with a gun coming after you or a guy with the thing he wants to put into your nose coming after you, you don't have time to think, hmm, should I go this way or that way? You gotta just run, right? And so that's why um, it's the stress response on steroids is what it is. Um, so anyway, so if your memory, uh, if, if you're having trouble with cognition, thinking, decision-making, because you're under a lot of stress and you're anxious about it, then the uh, C-Link would be good. And you can alternate a message. So it also <coughs> modulates IL-6 and balances T-helper cell cytokine, elevates BDNF in the hippocampus, influences on monoamine neurotransmitter and diminishes breakdown of enkephalin. So all basically the same, okay? Therapeutic applications, major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder. Non-sedating, non-addictive, and no cognitive impairment, okay? So if you're just wanted to use it rather than, an, rather than a benzodiazepine, why do I say that? Because the allostatic, allosteric modifier of the GABA receptor amplifies affinity of the receptor for GABA. Benzodiazepines are allosteric uh, modulators of the type A GABA receptor. So it increases inhibitory action of GABA. All right, that's what this does, and that's what the benzodiazepines, except it's not sedating. It doesn't make you sleepy. I do it, and I'll do it, and I'll, I'm, I'm, I, I can concentrate for hours. So it's not sedating. And not addictive, of course. C link immunological effect <laughs> regulates inflammatory response. BCLX protein serves as an important transcriptional re regulator of the immune system. Pivotal role of the B BCL6 <clears throat> is in regulating B and T cell development, and it also has antiviral activity. So you'll see that if we can use this and a few other peptides, we can really restore and balance the immune system in people with cancer, autoimmune conditions, um, chronic fatigue, uh, you know, any condition that is debilitating and, and, uh, and serious. Prevents weight gain. It's an anticoagulant, fibrolytic, and antiplatelet. And that's due to this, and that's the reason why, um, I mean, it, it, and it decreases glucose. So it's a hypoglycemic and an anticoagulant. <clears throat> and that is both C-max and C-link have it, which is due to the pro uh, proline glycine proline sequence. C-link and gastric ulcer, it accelerates gastric ulcer healing, improves blood supply and lymphatic circulation to the gastric mucosa. Dosing. As, as I said, you can combine it synergistically with CMAX. Again, 300 to 1,000 micrograms, sub-Q once a day, two times per week, alternate with CMAX, and the intranasal is available. However, as I, <clears throat> you can be doing one or the other every day. And that's important when you got an older person who's um, starting to lose it. All right? No, nothing part-time is going to work for them. But of course, you're going to change their diet. You're going to balance their hormones. You're going to get rid of their uh, toxicities, dental toxicities, medical toxicities, <clears throat> metal, metal toxicities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's some great homeopathic, as you sure I'm talking to the, to, to the, the right group here, um, great homeopathics to get rid of some of the um, um, chemical toxins we have from living in the 21st century. Now, the <coughs> renin angiotensin system in the brain is believed to be involved in the process beyond mere hydroelectric electro, electrolytic homeo homeostatic control. It has been implicated in the process of learning and memory and neuronal differentiation and nerve regeneration, okay? As well as the pathophysiology of various diseases, all right? Dysregulation in the brains, RIS, has been reported in studies of patients with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and extinct intellectual disability. Okay, so um, 
the point I wanted to, I don't want to read all of this to you, but the point I wanted to make here was Yeah, and then, so for example, the hexapeptide um, angiotensin four and its various analogs have been found to exert anti-gambosin effects in animal models on epilepsy, protect against cerebral ischemia, improve endothelial function in animal models of, of atherosclerosis, and enhance long-term potentiation in vitro and in vitro, in vitro uh, in vivo. So one of the ones that, where's the, I don't have the name of it. I wanted to show you the name anyway, but it's called dihexa and dihexa is for, fortunately in an oral form. You can take it, you can take two pills in the morning and you'll be, you'll be clear and um, focused most of the day, most of the day. My, um, one of my, my former nurse who lives here also in Thailand, who um, is part of, um, uh, is, is, is part of, very much responsible for bringing peptides to Thailand, um, has been using dihexa daily. You know, the only potential uh, problem with it is that it's been shown to increase angiogenesis. So. Theoretically, if someone has cancer or is at risk for cancer, they should avoid it. Now, that being said, there's no data. And there's been a lot of research with it, too. Um, so. Anyway, uh, learned avoidance. So further studies of. ANG4 and several ANG4 analogs have shown these peptides to facilitate long-term potentiation, learning and memory consolidation, increase in cerebral blood flow and neuroprotection, okay? So uh, they were, and the, one of the analogs that we're talking about, dihexa, reverses deficits in dementia models induced by treatment with cholinergic muscarinic receptor, scopolamine, um, Kinic acid injections into hypothalamus, perforant path cuts, ischemia, resulting from transient four vessel occlusion. Nice thing to do. But anyway, despite such promising results, various uh, physiochemical properties of these peptides have hindered their development. And IV is susceptible, uh, and four is, is susceptible to metabolic degradation and too big to cross the blood brain barrier. Therefore, they came up with this, with, and it has a <clears throat> 10 million times the potency of BDNF. That's a pretty potent uh, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It mimics HDF, um, hepatocyte growth factor, and activates CMET, which is a pathway for growth and proliferation. So for these reasons, they're saying, well, thank God, if you have a tumor, it could really stimulate it. it said, but in animal models, dihexa has been shown effective in reversing or limiting almost <clears throat> every model of cognitive dysfunction. So it's, it's available orally. The transdermal looks like it's going to be actually better. Usually 10 milligrams for preventative, 50 to 70 for a neurodegenerative condition. Uh, and although it activates the CMET pathway, there has been no leak linked to cancer at all. And there's been a lot of studies. Um, I can send you some and you can also just look it up and you'll see that uh, there's been a lot of work in this area. So the combination, this is what I've been doing with this with this 80 year old, 80, 80 something year old uh, to get him off 30 years of Ritalin was C-Lank, C-Max and uh, Dihexa. Dihexa orally and the C-link and the C-max uh, nasally. Okay, <clears throat> switching gears. And, and there are, listen, there are many, many more. There's a few others that I really wanted to talk about that are very important, but we just don't have time regarding um, uh, cognitive problems, regarding uh, 
traumatic brain injury regarding stroke, cerebrovascular accidents. Okay, so just a quick review of cytokines um, secreted primarily white blood cells, T cells, epithelial cells, two groups based on um, uh, the effect they have on lymphocytes, Th1 and Th2. So as we know, because um, we study, this is the stuff we study and we, we like, the Th1 dominant is, is best when you're, and it's what you have, whoops, when you're younger in life, where was I? Yeah, uh, promotes cell-mediated immunity, right? And then the, uh, the Th2 is the humoral immunity, okay? So, and the, cell, the cellular immunity is the, uh, the killer cells, the activated lymphocytes, CD8, uh, natural killer cells, et cetera. Okay. So a failure of the Th1 arm, or in other words, to get the polarizations over to Th2, results in these chronic conditions, AIDS, uh, chronic fatigue, candidiasis, multiple allergies, uh, multiple chemical uh, sensitivities, viral hepatitis, Gulf War syndrome, cancer, et cetera. So C Th1 cytokines, such as interleukin-2, interleukin-12, gamma interferon, and IgA, support mucosal immunity. I, when I'm working with somebody with cancer, I use all, I, I use some peptides that directly kill the cancer and a few peptides that stimulate the immune system and bring it back to the Th1. Uh, and we can measure that by measuring the interferon gamma. We find the interferon gamma actually increased. The other thing we do is we do a, a blood test called a lymphocyte subset so that we can um, um, look at the before and after to see what, what changes. I'm sure you're all familiar with that test, but it looks at the different, um, the relative proportions of the lymphocytes that we have, including uh, CD56, the uh, natural killer cells. So, with that in mind, so since before birth, the thymus gland is instrumental in the production of maturation of T lymphocytes. So that's why it's called T cells. They're called T cells because um, they're they they all go to uh, they all go to under undergraduate school in the um, in the bone marrow, and then some get accepted into the University of Thymus. They get to the University of Thymus. And it's kind of like uh, the CIA headquarters. They graduate as, uh, as trained assassins called T-cells. But they haven't been given a target yet. So they're what they call, we call them naive. And they're naive. So what do they need? Well, they have two friends called dendritic cells and macrophages that are out there looking for targets, as we all know. But anyway, this gland shrinks. Right, it becomes surrounded by fat, and the actual parenchyma of the gland shrinks to the point of being <clears throat> largest at puberty, 25 grams at 25, 60. And then you get down to me, just five grams. So do I, do, do I use TA1? Absolutely. I love T cells. I love natural killer cells. Thymosin, so thymic involution. <clears throat> Thymic involution results in Th1 to Th2 shift, which decreases thymosin alpha-1 and thymosin beta-4, which results in increased risk of opportunistic, opportunistic and intracellular infections, autoimmunity, inflammation, and risk of cancer. Also, the decreased telomere length in the, in the immune cells. So if your T cells and your B cells um, are, are, are have short telomeres, they can't divide anymore. And as you know, if something is encountered that requires a powerful immune response, you've got to have clonal expansion. But if you don't have short telomeres on your B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells, not going to happen. Now, thymus and alpha-1, this is the one I was talking about to be before that has such a good um, effect with, <clears throat> with the COVID-19. Um, it's the 28 amino acid. Um, it enhances T cells, dendritic cells, and antibody responses, modulates cytokines and chemokine production. 
It enhances natural killer cell system and stimulates the immune response by stimulating stem cells and augmenting the production of new immune cells. So when we were using it with cancer, we were giving it concomitantly with 5-FU um, or, or after uh, uh, radiotherapy. <clears throat> and we're able to maintain the NK activity of the spleen, which is very important. And what I was also gonna say a moment ago, excuse me one second. I'm so sorry. There's a, a emergency, but some patients having a problem. Okay. Uh, anyway, I hope she's okay. Hopefully, she will be. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Um. Oh, anyway, what I wanted to say before, let me go back here and uh, where was it? Where was it? Yeah, here. So what, what I was going to say is that I, in addition to giving all the peptides that I give, <clears throat> I give interleukin-2. Um, and there's an amazing uh, article. Uh, if you anybody works with cancer, uh, the combination of TA1 and interleukin-2, both low dose. Now, IL-2 is used, interleukin-2 is used um, in high doses with cancer, much like they used to use, you all remember um, with hepatitis B, they used to use interferon, and they gave such high doses that the people said, I'd rather die than take that again, or I'd, you know, I'd rather die from... <laughs> Uh -oh. Sorry, I think Gaurav unmuted by mistake. Um, extremely sorry about that, Dr. Thomas. No, 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 no problem, no problem. Um, uh, but anyway, so um, um, anyway, if you, if anybody ever, ever helped, gave a patient that with uh, <clears throat> hepatitis B, I think way back 30 years ago, right? The patient said, I forget it, I want to die. I don't want to take this medicine again. Well, it's the same kind of thing with the interleukin too. You know, they give like 90,000 units, 100,000 units, right? We give 3,000. Well, I'm sorry, they give 90 million, 100 million, we give 3 million, small dose, and only six days a week for four weeks. But that, what does it do? Interleukin two is one of the, ways in which the immune system is woken up. So when it's part of the febrile response to awaken our... Um, um, to, to awaken, awaken our, um, um, uh, uh, our immune system, to activate it, right? To get it out of a surveillance mode and into an active clonal expansion mode, right? So interleukin-2 is very important. So you combine that with the TA1 and you, uh, you, you have a amazing improvement in your uh, TH1. You turn back on your TH1. And you can see this is not only for cancer, this is for, you know, everything. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> now, just a reminder here is the, uh, again, the drug it, the, the name of the drug when they got it, um, uh, the TA1, was called Z Zadaxin, right? And it was in, I forget how many countries. And now it's hard to get. Um, but anyway, you can see what it does. Okay, stimulates dendritic cells, which act and macrophages. So it activates the dendritic and ma macrophage uh, complex. Very, very important, right? It also stimulates the precursor T cell to become an activated Th1, 
right? And it also uh, 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 activates uh, the cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells. So basically every part of the immune system that is essential for viruses and cancer are activated by thymus and alpha-1. Restores NK cell activity. So this is all very important. We use this also when people This is very important. Um, um, with people who have gone through uh, radiotherapy or gone through chemotherapy, um, all of this stuff is very, very important. In fact, what I like to do is to use it concomitantly. So uh, I never, I rarely recognize radio, uh, recommend or agree with radiotherapy, and I, you know, but but sometimes it's necessary, absolutely. And um, uh, so when it is. Or, uh, but high dose chemo is never necessary. You get not only the same benefits, but you get no side effects and you get immune stimulation by low dose chemo, what they call metronomic chemotherapy. Okay, and then if you add insulin, you're, up, you're, you're, you're walking on water already. All right, so. Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, so anyway, these are very, very important. And I think anybody undergoing right now, we see that the world is gripped by fear. And as we know, fear shuts off natural killer cell activity completely. You, you, you can't even find the interferon gamma in most people nowadays. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is what fear does. <clears throat> so this was the study in 2019, um, reduced, uh, um, it's not 20, it was in 2020. I don't have the date here. But anyway, uh, TA1 reduced the mortality of severe chrono. Um, cor that's when they call it coronavirus 2019 by restoration of lymphocytopenia and, re and reversion of exhausted T cells. So TA1 tr treatment significantly reduced mortality of severe blah, 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 blah. These patients with counts in circulation less than 400 or 650 respectively gained more benefit from the TA1. <coughs> improves tissue repair and healing, improves host defense to infections, improves microcirculation and inhibits viral, viral replication. Increases chemotactic response and phagocytosis, uh, normalizes immune balance, and promotes Th2 to Th1 shift back to that. The reason I'm spending so much time is it's probably, it's, there's no contraindication at all. Almost anybody can benefit by it and it can be used prophylactically. Usually the way we, uh, we give it is um, uh, if someone's really sick, you give it daily, subcutaneously uh, for 10 days and then twice a week. And it's 1.6 milligrams. So the vials are 10 milligrams. And then you, you put in, you reconstitute with the water, sterile water. And then, so you get what? Four, is it four and a half? Four and a half doses? Or I forget, but I think like that. Um, which is because you get three, six, you get six doses out of it. Yeah. Doses. Yeah. So it's very, it's very good. Um, which means it's it, and now if um, and if you're doing it twice a week, that's going to last you quite a long time. But if someone's sick, trying to get through something that, that that's they're in trouble, then you just keep giving it to them daily. But even with cancer patients, we give it 10, 14 days at the most, and then twice a week, or maybe three times a week, because remember that even uh, uh, it's pretty much eaten up, degraded by the body. But if the effects stay around for about a week. So slow, uh, these, are, these are the biomarkers of thymus and alpha deficiency, slow and difficult wound healing, increased inflammatory markers, um, and low CD4, CD8. Reduces inflammation, improves tolerance to stress, reverses immunosuppression by chronic fatigue, 
fibromyalgia, Lyme, increases antioxidant and glutathione production. Uh, approved in 35 countries, that's what it is. No documented adverse effect. It's considered a, a vaccine <coughs> adjunct. <coughs> Prior to the whole, uh, the, the worldwide uh, hoax, uh, it was used for HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. And it was approved as an orphan drug in the US. Thymus and beta-4. This is the one that does stimulate um, because it, this is, you find this being produced in wounds. If you were to evaluate the chemicals produced in a wound, you would find that they have much more thymus and beta-4 than uh, <clears throat> normal tissue, okay? Because it, 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 it stimulates healing. And what do we know is one important part of healing, and that is angiogenesis. So, but one of the benefits is, is it actually can restore um, hair growth. And I've seen that with a, with a kid who had um, um, alopecia totalis. It took about a year and a half, and his hair was... So... Reactivates progenitor cells to repair damaged tissue, promotes rapid wound healing, uh, potent anti-inflammatories, reduces acute and chronic pain, supports tissue stem cell to heal and regenerate the tissue, works in muscle to protect against sarcopenia. So it's really good for so many things, but if you do have cancer, then you can't use it because it does stimulate angiogenesis. The mechanism of upregulation is, is, is with actin and myosin, as you know, which are the, uh, uh, components of muscle, the contractile components of muscle, enhances collagen deposition, upregulation of actin to promote healing, cell growth, cell migration, cell proliferation. And because of its low molecular weight, it's able to, to when it leaves the, the thymus, it goes to any cell in the body that needs it. Now, going back to the pro uh, opio melanocortin, um, each, is, uh, each is packaged in larger dense core vesicles of Okay, so here's just as a reminder here, we've got the alpha melanocyte, melanocyte stimulating hormone functions with other hormones in the regulation of appetite. Um, but causing satiety. The alpha MSH also coordinates sexual behavior, which we'll be talking about. Alpha MSH uh, from the intermediary lobe of the pituitary regulates melanin. ACTH uh, regulates the secretion of glucocorticoids from the adrenal cortex, DHEA and aldosterone. And then the beta endorphins, we see over here, um, are produced in the brain for in pain. So mechanisms of sexual arousal. Sexual, sexual excitation involves the activation of neurotransmitters such as nor, nor, noradrenaline, oxytocin, which stimulates sexual arousal, and dopamine, and melanocortins, which stimulate attention and desire within the regions of the hypothalamus and limbic system in response to sexual cues and stimulation. So the activation of those neurochemical systems blunts the influence of the inhibitory mechanisms, such as endogenous opioids, which are released into the cortex, limbic system, hypothalamus, midbrain during an orgasm or sexual reward. And endocannabinoids, which mediate sedation and serotonin, which is released in those regions to induce refractoriness and sexual satiety. Okay, so it blocks those as well as turns on the noradrenaline, the oxytocin, the dopamine, turns off those. So the sexual excitation can be primed um, internally by steroid action or externally by uh, in sexual incentives or drugs. But of note, very important note here is that um, if you've had any male patients with erectile dysfunction, you'll find that they have, they get to a point where um, the, <clears throat> The Bi Viagra, or Cialis, or uh, what's the other one? Levitra, um, stop working. You give them this, and they are 16 years old again. And no kidding. It's, yeah, pretty amazing. So the melanocortins. And for that reason, you do not mix the. Uh, um, which we'll talk about uh, um, the PT-141, you don't mix it with any of the, um, you know, Viagra, Viagra or the other 
PG inhibitors because uh, you can wind up with preoptism. So you, because you don't need it anyway, you don't want it. Okay, so neuropeptides derived from pro opio uh, include beta endorphin, ACTH, alpha melanocytes. Of those, the MC3 and MC4 subtypes exist in hypothalamic and limbic regions of the animal brain. Estradiol increases the alpha MSH levels in the medial basal hypothalamus of female rats, suggesting that alpha MSH release may be one of the several intermediates of estrogen activity. Okay. And because we, we all know that, and if we all remember that the way God designed the, the us was that <clears throat> uh, the rise and peak of estrogen and then the quick deceleration, which results in ovulation, that peak in the estrogen and what we're seeing here with the alpha MSH um, is probably a significant reason why women around ovulation become more um, uh, arousable, more inclined to want to have sex. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. You know, God thought of everything. Everything. We don't have to come up with stuff. He thought of it. Anyway, so the system arises in the arctic nucleus of the hypothalamus and projects drossily to hypothalamic limbic forebrains. The system potentiates sexual desire through an interaction with dopamine. Now, the thing that's important to realize is that this is a centrally mediated, centrally activated um, modification of the sexual response. This is much different than any drug. Now, but I'm going to show you in a moment but this is not just for men. In fact, the PT-141 has finished uh, FDA uh, testing and was approved in 2019 as the female Viagra. Um, so now the MSH analogs, melatonin 2 and 1 and brem, brem melanotide, which is also called PT-141. Okay. So there's five different members of these receptor system. And there you can see them there. But the, so it's the MC1R that's associated with pigmentation genetics, right? People have taken this, take, and, and you get very dark. So it's, it's people with vitiligo, like full body vitiligo, like this a lot. So these, these two work for the ACTH alone. Um, anyway. So the development of melanotan 2 for aphrodisiac effects. It's estimated that, I don't know the, uh, oh, by the way, I, I did never answer your question. Is it legal in India, um, the uh, epithalon? Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know why not. I mean, I, I really don't know, but I, I think we could find out. And also, um, if I can connect one of you to this company that we use in the US, yeah. one, of you, one of you to become the distributor, then you could, they would, maybe they know because they're, they, they distribute worldwide and they, they know what's, um, now just yeah. to let you, just so to let you. So Dr. Thomas, I know of, uh, some doctor who uses, uh, peptides in India in uh, onco cases, and uh, I will connect with you after this and see what we can do. If it is not available in India, how can we make it available and whether it's legal or not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And as I said, the, the Zodaxin should be legal. It's legal in 35 countries. One of those countries must be India, I hope. Should so, be, because I know of some doctors who are using it. So okay. I will also check with them how they are doing it. And meanwhile, I'll connect with you in this company and see beautiful. how we can bring it. Beautiful, beautiful. And what they, what the company does is they send over the raw material to a compounding pharmacist who then uh, gets the formula from this company and can turn it into a nasal because not all of them are, some of them are too big to be uh, used nasally, but all of those that can be used nasally, of course, it's much preferable because people don't like to give themselves injections every day, or at least to minimize the number of injections. So, Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dr. Thomas, there are a few more questions. Can I take them now yeah. before we continue, or you would want to take them at the end? Um, well, I don't, let's see, where, where are we? How, how many slides do we have? I guess we're okay. Let's, let's do quickly. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. 
Did I ask you the questions, Dr. Thomas? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, so uh, there's this question, what peptides do you use in autoimmune disorders? And does thymosin has any role in autoimmunity? Yes, 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 yes. Because remember, autoimmunity like um, um, is Th2 dominant, right? Right. So, so this, this brings it back. In fact, all of the ones that we've been talking about bring back and reverse that fundamental problem with the immune system. So absolutely, um, yeah, I would definitely use use the TA1. Now, somebody with a severe um, a severe autoimmune condition, like uh, you know, like um, you know, a, 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 anyone that was that was uh, very acute and, and uh, extremely uncomfortable for the person, I would do it daily, uh, the 1.6 milligrams daily. But I would also use um, um, small amounts of maybe even only one million units of the IL-2, um, just a little bit, because you want the IL-2 to kind of, see what happens is um, when we look at chronic inflammation, we look at a chronic inflammatory uh, condition, we see that there's a switch to TH2. We also see the macrophages switch to an M2 and everything goes into this chronic phase. And in that chronic phase, what we have is tissue proliferation and pathological growth of all sorts of things. Okay, so one of the ways that the body, that God gets us out of that is God gives us a fever and we start producing all these acute cytokines that just stick us back, like without, without any warning, stick us right back into TH1 and get rid of all that stuff. In fact, that's what uh, Dr. William Coley did 100 years ago, as you know, at, Slo at um, Memorial Hospital in New York, which is now Sloan Kettering Memorial. Um, he found that the people uh, who had sarcomas you know, his job as a surgeon was to go in and amputate. And he kept finding people that they, they were, they healed spontaneously and left. He tracked them all down and found out they all had a, a serious infection with um, uh, with uh, erysipelas. And they, they had shaking chills for two weeks and it was gone. So Coley's toxin, all that sort of thing. So we have to shift the body out of this chronic inflammatory uh, allergic autoimmune kind of condition and bring it back to the TH1, which fights. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Dr. Thomas, another question we have is, does dihexa cause hypertension? Does which one? Dihexa. Di? Dihexa. Oh, From dihexa. You... Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> does it have an effect on hypertension? Yeah, yeah, so somebody with hypertension would uh, uh, would want to uh, monitor it. Um, now, um, I have had, oh, I don't know, 30, 50 people on it, and none of them have had high, I mean, none of them have had, have had a, a problem with their blood pressure. Um, and we follow them pretty closely. So I think, yeah, that's true. And I think if someone had uncontrolled hypertension and they weren't treating it at all, that you would say, well, listen, let's get, this, you, let's get your hypertension controlled first and treat it. And then when you start them on it, start them out with one a day, right? And then monitor and you know, take it on carefully, but there's no, no reason why you can't use it. Perfect, thank you. So Dr. Thomas, another question we have is, what peptides are bad and are there some peptides which need to be avoided in certain group of patients? And is there yeah, a group of, hmm? sorry, right. and is there a group of peptides which supports gut microbiome health? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, so what I will try to do is, not what I try to do, what I will do is that as we go through each peptide, I'll mention whether or not there are contraindications, right? Okay. And then, um, but what I also would like to uh, get everyone to agree on is, uh, and hopefully he'll he'll give us a talk, um, is that I think the the you'll be blown away when he when he gives a talk on peptides. You 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 can you don't even want to take notes. It's like listening to a to a to a symphonic orchestra of beautiful intellect. It's amazing. So he's a brilliant guy. But anyway, he could give us the. Uh, the answer he could probably give us lists in every category of what shouldn't be used. He has a broader because he he's the one he's one of the founders of um, of uh, Taylor Made uh, okay. in the U.S. So let's get him to to get some some of those specific. Those are all great questions. 
Sure. And any peptides you use to support gut health, Dr. Thomas? Yes, there is. Uh, BPC-157, and I didn't include it this time, <coughs> but um, this is pretty amazing. I have people that come in with bloated stomach, bloated, bloated abdomens, um, you know, they, they're uncomfortable, they can't eat much of anything because they get bloated. Um, and, and of course, because of all the gas, they're constipated, uh, or they have, uh, yeah, so they've got basically a dysbiosis, right? You take these, you take two of these, and they're orally, fortunately, used to be when we first started, there was only injectable, but they're orally, you take two of them a day for three months. Okay. You got a flat belly. You got a flat belly. It really helps with the dysbiosis. But keep in mind something. How did we get a dysbiosis? We have to keep that in mind. So whatever we're, we're being exposed to in our environment that's killing the healthy bacteria, we have to stop that exposure, number one. And number two, perhaps even more importantly, if we want to have a certain, if I want to raise horses, what do I need? I need to have pasture land with good grass, hay, alfalfa. That's what I need. I don't need anything else. I need that. If I want to raise lions, then I got to have a jungle full of animals. So in other words, each organism requires the food that it requires in order to grow and propagate. So <clears throat> the bacteria that live on a fast food diet are not the same bacteria that would be benefit our health, right? So if you're, let's say I was eating fast food, but I was taking probiotics all day long and I took the BPC-157. <laughs> I, 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 you, know, you understand, I, couldn't, I wouldn't be able to feed the new guys. Right. There wouldn't, wouldn't be any food for them. So we have to remember, you limit your exposure to anything that's going to kill them. And number two, you make sure you're feeding them well. And they, what do they like? Vegetables, fruit, nuts, seeds. They love it. And, um, you know, if you anyone looks and studies anatomy and physiology of the human being, that our gut is, in one sense, like an herbivore, and in another sense, uh, uh, like a primate. Um, but we have a longer small intestine. So even though we have a longer small intestine, uh, uh, which allows us to get a quick energy from fruit and things like that, we also do some hindgut uh, fermentation. Right, so we that's why we have a cecum and we have a colon, and we, we do that because gorillas, for example, get 30% of their energy from uh, hind gut fermentation, right? Much less than the, than the orangutans and the chimps. But anyway, we're in that same group, as you know, uh, phylogenically, and so yeah, but anyway, the, the point is, is that um, by eating the foods that we were designed to eat by God, by nature, then what happens is that everything turns out to work perfectly. Right. So, uh, Dr. Thomas, last question is, are these peptide intakes safe for kidney stage four? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so stage four, are you, are you meaning already on dialysis? Yeah, no, he's no. saying no. No, not yet. Okay, so they're not yet on dialysis. Yeah, it's not going to, they're not going to impair. You know, <clears throat> if you think about them, what they're doing is remember, they don't have, they're not drugs, so they don't have extra effects that you don't know about. You know, if this is like CMAX for cognitive function, that's what it'll affect. It won't affect kidney function at all, right? And if it's, uh, yeah, and, and if it's for sexuality, it's not going to affect anything except the sexual response. It's not going to affect the kidneys. It has no effect on the kidneys. Oh, that's good news. Yes. Yeah. yeah, because otherwise, you know, more than half the time we are thinking about what are the other effects this thing will have. Right. And, and, and the beauty is the beauty is that um, <clears throat> only the organs, since it's uh, especially the, the, the melanotan derivatives, um, all of the organs involved centrally from the hypothalamus limbic system down to the genitalia, all of the systems involved are not the kidney system and not the liver. Yeah. It's not the liver. So it's only going to affect that system. And that's the beauty of peptides, right? They don't have, they're not greedy. They don't grab everything. They just do what they, they're looking for their receptors. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, we can continue, uh, Dr. Thomas. Thanks for answering these questions so beautifully. You're very uh, welcome. Yes.
So ACTH and alpha MSH generate sexual stimulation and penile erection in various animal species, including rats, <coughs> rabbits, dogs, and monkeys. Both melanotan-1 and melanotan-2 are analogs of the alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. It's the melanotan-1, as I was saying before, that makes people very dark. So unless, like maybe an albino, I wonder what it would do to an albino, because they simply don't have melanocytes. So, but, uh, so they, could, they, could simply, they could easily use this for other purposes, because it still has all the other the sexual response. Um, so the melanotan-2 and the, and the bre bremelanotide, um, two is seven amino acids. It's a derivative of melanotan-2. It's a potent initiator of erection with minimal side effects. Again, the MC3 and the MC4 receptors in the brain, which activate the penis, the, the erection. Now, <clears throat> it activates the endogenous pathways involved in the sexual response centrally mediated, fast acting, okay? And it binds to these receptors. So um, it's very interesting. I, you know, when you think of, for example, when you think of some men um, that are unable to uh, have a, get an erection, it's because of the, um, you know, they just have, they have system-wide atherosclerosis, right? And so they just can't get blood into the penis anymore, right? And so that's why these, uh, these drugs that increase nitric oxide expand that and allow the blood to rush through. So here you have here you have something that's not even dealing with that, and you get the erection. So that's that's important to know. That's why um, it reminds me. It keeps me reminded that um, sexuality, the sexual response, the sexual experience, is more in here than out here. You know, because if you think about it. If you think about it, people that have fetishes for whatever kind of object, how could the object do anything, right? How could, the, how could an object elicit an arousal? It's all here, it's all here. So anyway, um, but this is kind of a, a reminder that uh, sexuality, probably we think of the most primal of physical activities is not at all physical. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is, but, okay. So here, now this was a, a very important uh, libido peptide for female. Study in premenopausal pre women with sexual arousal disorder. It was only 18 women. This was back in 2006. This is what led to the uh, FDA investigating, okay? More women reported moderate or high sexual desire following treatment versus placebo. 20 milligram int intranasal dose. Now, here we had 400 premenopausal women diagnosed with female sexual arousal disorder, hypoactive sexual desire, uh, desire disorder, or both were enrolled in multi-centered randomized placebo-controlled parallel group dose ranging trial. <laughs> Patients were treated for 16 weeks and randomized to one of four double-blind treatment groups receiving placebo or subcutaneous uh, bremelanotide doses of 0 0.75, 1.25, 1.5. Responder analysis showed there is a statistically significant increase in the percentage of women whose total score on the female sexual index, 69% versus 46 for placebo. Now that's pretty good for placebo. I mean, 46% for placebo just hones right into the point of how much sexuality is a, is a, is a, is a psychological process. Okay, because placebo, if you think this is going to work and you unleash whatever type of inhibitory um, mechanisms you have going on psychologically that you're not even aware of, then here you go. Anyway, so 50% increase in satisfying sexual events versus 12% with placebo. Therefore, in 2019, the drug's name is Vilesi, Vilesi. Vilesi, which is called the female Viagra. So they had 30 clinical trials with over 2,500 patients. Anyway, it's now, it's now considered a uh, female Viagra. And it, it gives, um, and of course, you know, women, it has nothing to do with 
um, with erections or anything like that. So it's just basically the sexual response, the libido. Neurohormone acting at the CNS level, binding to melanocone receptors in the hypothalamus. Rapid onset of arousal, erection achieved within minutes, found to induce erection in 80% of males who did not respond to PDE5s, inhibitor drugs. And flushing, nausea, gastrointestinal. Again, penile erection, if, it, if you're giving this to a male, do, do not give them Viagra with it. Yeah, anyway. The study of a, fail, a, a failure with the sild, sildenafil with PD, PT-141, okay? So they were given 10 milligrams as an intranasal spray at 45 minutes or two hours prior to sexual stimulation. And they used at least 16 doses or 10. <clears throat> Minor side effects, nausea, flushing, headaches. Patients in the group reported significantly greater intercourse satisfaction than those in the placebo group. Sometimes it takes two to six hours, uh, depends on the person. At I would say a minimum of an hour, two hours. Oxytocin has been best known for its roles in female reproduction. It is released in large amounts during labor, as we all know, and after stimulation of the nipples. It's a facilitator for childbirth and breastfeeding. However, recent studies have shown that it is involved in orgasm, social recognition, bonding, and maternal behavior. So it's a, it's a nine amino acid peptide. Um, and it's, a, it's also now believed to be very much involved in uh, physiological and pathological functions such as sexual activity, penile erection, ejaculation, pregnancy, uterine contraction, milk ejection, maternal behavior, social bonding, stress, which makes oxytocin and its receptor potential candidates as targets for drug therapy. I hate when they do that. Just use the hormone. Anyway, this looked into the different kinds of uh, female orga orgasms. And um, as you can see, this one down here looks pretty nice, ecstasy. Anyway, it's a very interesting study. It's worth reading. But uh, this is also part of how it became FDA approved. Orgasm in men, one of the main and now well-characterized peripheral oxytocin targets is erectile tissue, the corpus spongiosum and chiropractic. It's Moreover, it's thought to be associated with ejaculation by increasing sperm number and contracting ejaculation tissue, especially prostatic urethra, bladder, neck, and ejaculatory duct. By the way, if you've got older men who have BPH, one of the reasons for BPH is uh, a lack of uh, uh, ejaculation. Their testosterone levels go down. They stop having sex. They don't ejaculate. They wind up with getting engorged um, prostates. So you got to write a prescription. Must ejaculate once a day. Anyway, So the dosing can be sublingual or nasal, 50 to 150 micrograms is needed. Okay. Uh, this one we won't spend much time on because I have, I have been uh, disappointed, but kiss pep, peptin, um, puberty begins with a kiss. This is the uh, peptide, neuroendocrine peptide that was found to initiate puberty. And it was discovered in Hershey's, Pennsylvania so they called it kiss peptin. Isn't that clever? Kiss peptin is a peptide that is encoded by the kiss one gene. Now it was originally identified as the human metastasis suppressor gene for melanoma and breast cancer. Okay, so suppressor of metastasis and um, um, uh, uh, melanoma and, and breast. Anyway, I won't go into much with this, but basically it increases LH, it increases FSH, it increases testosterone. 
five men 60 years and older, testosterone increased with kispeptin, but, not com but less compared with younger men, age 29. So if you got a young man who doesn't have quite, and we see a lot of young men now with, who, who are having low testosterone, instead of giving them exogenous testosterone, perhaps give them kispeptin and let them produce their own. Now, there are several antidepressant um, peptides, but I'm only gonna use this one today. So depression, as, as you know, depre depression, if you've ever seen a major depression, it's devastating. And it's said to affect 20% of the world's population. And despite uh, some benefit from the uh, SSRIs, um, there's some pretty serious side effects from that. So spadin, which is <coughs> PE1228, is an endogenous peptide with antidepressant activity. It specifically draw, blocks the TREK1 channel. TREK1 channels are ubiquitous potassium channels that play a pivotal role in stabilizing membrane potential and thus prevent cellular excitability. Okay, so they're used, uh, they have, there's lots of pharmacological um, benefit with, with pain, epilepsy, stroke, and depression. In mice, the deletion of the TREK1 gene results in a depression-resistant phenotype that mimics antidepressant treatments. It is also associated with enhanced serotonergic neurotransmission and an increased neurogenesis in the hippocampus. Specific for TREK1 and devoid of any TREK1-related side effects, very important. The monoamine hypothesis of depression was expanded to other recent hypotheses, mainly blah, 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 blah. In other words, uh, such as the brain-derived neurotrip factor. Um, classical antidepressants take several weeks to produce their effect. This one can, uh, this works within four days and you can do it nasally. Uh, oh. And it has very, very similar effect as ketamine, except that ketamine, ketamine uses the mTOR pathway, whereas spadin does not interfere with mTOR signaling. And that's important because, you know, as you know, mTOR signaling can stimulate cancer. So small enough for nasal absorption, four milligrams per milliliter and a six milliliter spray, two sprays daily, and results should be seen within a, a few days. So <clears throat> I'm jumping all over the place. I apologize, but no, no, we are, we are really liking it because if you won't have jumped, we would have many more questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so sleep and not sleep. CJC 1295 promotes slow wave sleep, which is delta wave sleep. And um, as you know, basically there are two... Uh, two types of sleep. There's restorative sleep and there's REM sleep. And prior to about 2 a.m., our 90-minute cycles are dominated by uh, restorative sleep, maybe 80% and only 20% to REM. And then after about 1 or 2 a.m., whatever our particular reset point is, it reverses. So we wind up having predominant REM and less restorative, which is why going to bed early is imperative not negotiable. But anyway, so a lot of people can't get into delta sleep. This little baby here, completely delta. So just a reminder, you know, right now we're all in beta, hopefully. Uh, this is watching TV, listening to music, whatever, nope, just hanging out. Theta is when we're <coughs> dreaming. We're just watching. Remember, when you're dreaming, you don't edit your thinking. You're just watching it happen. Same thing happens when you're jogging. If you're a jogger or a or a, do you do anything long, long and repetitive, you will not. Um, you, your thoughts just go by. And so med meditation is somewhere between alpha and theta. And they say that uh, people that have been meditating for decades can be in complete meditation in delta. 
So delta sleep inducible peptide was discovered in 1974 in the blood of a rabbit. Yeah. Uh, Mino, a nine amino acid has been found in both pre and bound forms in the hypothalamus limbic system of the pituitary. However, the gene for DSIP and where it is made from is still unknown. So we, we've, we can find the peptide, but we can't find the gene. So this is a very small study, but six chronic insomniacs. These are people that didn't sleep for 20 years uh, and improved their sleep quality. That's a big deal. If, if you've ever had anybody who really doesn't sleep. And the problem, the reason you can't do it every night is the tachy, tachyphylaxis. So give it maybe two nights a week. I would say two nights a week. And then use melatonin and stuff like that. If you do maybe three nights a week for a while. But don't be, they're all of the, you know, they always put the indications on to give you minimal, forget the minimal. You want to get maximum. Okay, so now, um, the hallmarks of aging, <laughs> dysregulated nutrient sensing, loss of proteosasis, altered intracellular communication, stem cell exhaustion, telomere attrition, mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular senescence, a big one, and epigenetic alterations, and here they all are. This is what happens when we see aging. Now, uh, you may know about this guy. If you don't, please get this book. Um, David Sinclair, um, The Revolutionary Science of Why We Age and Why We Don't Have to. Amazing, amazing book. Where is it? I have it here somewhere. Um, Anyway, so his conclusion is this, and this guy is a, a, a scholar. His conclusion is that the dysregulation of cell cells contributes to aging by causing them to lose their genetic and epigenetic identity. This happens because sirtuins are distracted by damage and are unable to regulate the epigenetic genome changes. You all know what sirtuins are. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about them in a moment. <clears throat> this results in all the hallmarks of aging listed above. So sirtuins are a class of proteins that deacetylate or actually turn off transcription of certain genes. They control the epigenome, the proteomics, and the DNA repair. Okay, humans have seven sirtuins. Okay, one, six, and seven, two shuttle between nucleus and cytoplasm, three, four, and five control mitochondrial function. Sirtuins are activated by NAD+. As you age, NAD levels decrease. Dr. Sinclair believes that when sirtuins are distracted, they are unable to regulate the epigenome and it becomes dysregulated and cells slowly lose their identity. Keeping sirtuins healthy uh, and active can prevent aging. What I wanted to show you here was, ah, yeah, was here. This is uh, the biological function stuff, a cert, cert one, is the one we're talking about with results to epigenetics, cancer, cardiovascular, metabolism, neuronal, inflammation, and stress, the CERT1, okay? All turned on by the NAD to NADH uh, ratio, the NAD plus to NAD ratio. That is how that is kept healthy, okay? And there are different sirtuins that do different things, but this is what I wanted to point out right now. Now, with caloric restriction, a decrease in caloric intake by 10 to 40 percent without malnutrition has been shown to increase lifespan and health span in all organisms in which it has been tested. The benefits of caloric restriction on metabolism and other cellular functions, such as cognition, depend on NAD plus sensing by CERT1. Okay, that's how powerful that is. So if you look here in the middle, you see the NAD plus, right? You see the... <clears throat> The, the, in the diet, right? We get nicotinic acid. It goes through these pathways and can produce NAD+. Then we have uh, de novo biosynthesis. This happens by the Karelian, I think it's pronounced Karelian, Karelian um, pathway. 
which is part of the tryptophan pathway. pathway. Do you all remember that tryptophan? Um, uh, the, first, the first step in tryptophan um, metabolism produces serotonin. And then as soon as the lights go out, then it stops producing the serotonin and continues down the pathway to produce melatonin. Okay, but when there's stress and unusual stress or, or whatever, uh, block, um, the uh, circadian rhythm is disturbed, then it diverts into what's called a Carilion uh, pathway, which produces NAD+. The, 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 the sad thing is, is that we make less and less NAD plus as we age. And if we do that, we're just not going to, there's nothing, there's nothing we can do. Okay, so what are the NAD plus consuming enzymes? The sirtuins, the PARP, and CD38, and CD157. Okay, so here we have the PARP. And as you can see, this is the one when we talk about in cancer, PARP inhibitors has to do with DNA repair, epigenetic repair, RNA processing, um, circadian rhythm. Because okay, so these use up NAD. Okay, the CERT ones use up NAD. Right? And then the CD38, which is responsible for inflammation, cell adhesion, signaling, and all of that uses up the NAD. And then uh, uh, epigenetic metabolism. Now, um, so recent preclinical studies have demonstrated diversified pharmacological activities of NMN uh, in cardiac and cerebral ischemia, Alzheimer's, diet, and age induced type 2 diabetes and obesity, all of which are linked to the deficiency of NAD+. Supplementing, supplementing with NMN uh, and NR, we can increase NAD plus levels, which can help activate sirtuin function and PARP function, which leads to repair in DNA and regular, better regulation of epigenetic identity. identity. Okay, so um, the... Let me see. Can't. Well, anyway, as you can see, it's a very complex system. It reminds me of uh, um, NF kappa beta. <clears throat> NF kappa beta kind of sits right in the center of the whole inflammatory cascade, right? If you can turn off NF kappa beta, you're going to, which curcumin does, which a lot of uh, botanical medicines do. If you can turn up, vitamin C does. Uh, if you can turn off NF kappa beta, you can stop the, uh, the, the whole inflammatory process. Well, NAD, if you can increase NAD in any way, you can extend life and, and improve everything. It's pretty, pretty amazing. So, why, why is this? Why is this here? Huh. Anyway, well, there we go. Okay, so nicotinamide mononucleotide um, supplementation promotes neurovascular rejuvenation in aged mice. Okay, so transcriptional footprint of SR, CERT1 activation, mitochondrial protection, anti-inflammatory, and anti-apoptotic. Now, I don't know if it's, if it's big in India yet. It, it, let me know if it is. Uh, but here, it's like, Everybody's got intravenous NAD plus. Oh, in India, it's not big right now. You got to get it. You got to get it. Yeah. Th this is important. NMN, right? And the NR. Um, but uh, because this is a precursor, and I'll show you, it's a precursor, and you can take it orally. But still, the IV is that when people get it, they really people... can see the difference. They actually say, wow, yeah. They go, they go, wow, they yes. go, their energy is back. I mean, it's everything. So the point is, um, yeah. So, I mean, if, if you can, I know of a guy mm -hmm. in the UK who, who is it, take, brings it all over the world and he's got really good quality. 
you if you need to try to get it into the country um he's I will check with you because I got a very small batch uh, recently but and um, I have not reordered again because we are not doing it too much in India uh and he's got all the protocols he's developed all the protocols so well, I'll he, connect with you yeah 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 okay so the nicotinamide mononucleotide treatment attenuates oxidative stress re rescues angio angiogenic capacity blah 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 Nico so rescues cerebral microvascular endothelial function so in other words it's pretty it's pretty amazing um but why did that happen you know what i think i when i was making this i kind of i finished i finished that section down so forgive me somehow i'll finish that later yeah all right <coughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's talk about cancer for a minute. We won't spend a lot of time because I don't think I don't think many of you deal with cancer specifically, right? I think a lot of um, us do have cancer patients, but uh, I'm not sure if somebody is exclusively working with cancer. Oh, okay. Well, if you do, then it would be, yeah, you'll you'll really you'll really appreciate it. Right. Excuse me one second. Okay, my God. Um, so the, the different direct, uh, targeting effects on cancer. So anyway. The three major parts of the of cancer are the lymph node, the blood, and the tumor microenvironment. That's why when uh, they uh, go in there and they say, oh, we removed 37 lymph nodes. Uh, five were positive. Well, if they're positive, that means the lymph node was doing its job, right? Unless the lymph node has been completely obliterated, completely taken over, and it's no longer a functional lymph node, then it's doing its job. It's developing a, an, immune, an immune response. It's the headquarters. It's, this is how the immune system works. <laughs> anyway, but uh, anyway, I just wanted to, to bring that up. I won't go into all of this about cancer. Okay, this is one that we like. It's opioid growth factor MET5. Uh, it's known as metenkephalin. This is uh, it's an endogenous pentapeptide, opioid growth factor. Um, regulates cell growth in normal and abnormal. Okay. It can control the cell cycle. So OGF, OGFR upregulation at the translational level produces oncostatic and on oncosuppressive effects. And that's what we try to do. So the OGF, OGFR axis regulates cell proliferation by altering the, the, the cell cycle through P16 and P21 cycling. So it's, it's called metenkephalin, it's called MET5, it's called OGF, um, but it stimulates an inhibitory pathways of cancer cell division. So imagine you do this while you're giving the TA1 and the IL2. So you're turning on the ones you want to and you're, and you're turning off the ones you don't want to. They found it to kill uh, colon, pancreas, squamous cell, neuroblastoma, renal, triple negative breast, ovarian, in vitro. Phase one human trials in 16 pancreatic cancer patients showed improved survival over standard 5-FU or genocidabine with good pain control. Okay, so it's, 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 it's tragic that those are the only two choices the patient gets. They don't give them, talk to them anything about all the other things we know that are important. Diet going to sleep early, you know, balancing hormones, oh, meditation, all, all this stuff. That's why you're doing research, I believe, is unethical. You don't do research on human beings or animals either. You just do everything possible. Well, how do you know what's possible? Well, you figure it out. You figure it out. But you don't do experiments on human beings. You know, what if that human being happened to be your mother or you? Is that okay? You want us, you want to be you want to be in the uh, control group? 
I think I'd rather be in the control group than in the, than in the, in the therapeutic arm. From what I know about the fantastic allopathic medical world. <clears throat> I'm a recovering allopath. Our findings in vivo or in vitro show that that treatment either in vivo or in vitro could upregulate the percentages of CD8 T cells, induce markers of activated T cells, increase cytotoxic activity against the S180 tumor cells, and increase secretion of interferon gamma. Okay, here's another study with melanoma. The tumor volume and weight with the, with the metencephalin treated group were lower than those in the control group and naltrexone. So they gave low-dose naltrexone plus the um, uh, MENK. And here was one with um, <coughs> regulating dendritic cells via the uh, met, uh, metencephalin. Thus it is concluded that metencephalin could exert anti-tumor effects through precisely regulating opioid receptor mediated function of dendritic cells. In addition, the MK treated D cells, DC cells may serve as a new immunotherapy approach against the tumor. So I just use this on everybody. And then here we go with uh, improves lymphocyte cell population in human peripheral of 50 cancer patients by inhibiting, inhibiting regulatory T cells, T regs. As you may know, <clears throat> um, T regs uh, are, you want to inhibit those um, because otherwise they actually turn off the immune system, right? Because they're regulating it. They turn it down, they dial it down. And that's not what you want, right? You want to do that with, when you've got uh, autoimmune, things like that. You want to get it up. Opioid growth factor improves clinical benefit and survival in patients with advanced pancreatic cancer. Again, of the subjects surviving more than eight weeks, 62% either a decrease or stabilization tumor cell by CT. Median survival, 65.5 versus 21 days. But you can see with all, I mean, that was just manipulating this one particular peptide. But imagine the way one works with cancer and the one way one works with anyone is not by doing one thing and seeing how it's gonna work, the way we work with human beings, because we are human beings and we took an oath to save their lives and, and relieve their suffering, we don't say, well, I'm going to try this on this person, but not this. No, what the hell. I shouldn't have been given my medical license if I'm going to do something like that. Sorry if you're researchers out there, but I don't think it's ethical to do experimentation on human beings. So I give everybody everything. And if it's not working, it's not working. And I add it in. That's why I don't have. The, the, all the data I have is very global data, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, but there, but but again, everything I use has a ton of science with it, all science. But as you can see, when we're looking at here, we're looking at just what <clears throat> an extra thirty days, forty days, okay, um, and there was less pain. But you know, we could and do much better. Well, I, what I I've had st advanced stage four cancers go home, back to work. I had an orthopedic surgeon from California in Arizona, when I was in Arizona. <clears throat> he came in and he said, look, I don't have time for this. I got a busy practice. I said, okay. He was home in six weeks. Now, this one I like a lot, <coughs> PNC 27. Um, there are HDM2 proteins expressed on cancer cell membranes that this binds to in, on solid tumors and induces a transmembrane pore formation. So it doesn't happen in normal cells. It doesn't have this membrane, this pore, uh, protein. And it also stimulates, because <clears throat> it, it, P53, if it gets phosphorylated, which it does, it gets phosphorylated in most cancers, um, and that kind of stops it from being active, right? So this also um, gets that activated. Here's a, here's a uh, ovarian cancer. Conclusions, these findings show for the first time the efficacy of PNC27 on freshly isolated primary human cancer cells. Our results indicate that the potential of 
PNC27 peptide as an efficient alternative treatment of previously untreated ovarian cancer as well as ovarian cancer. Now, one thing I have to say about this, because it has a direct killing effect and not necessarily apoptosis, a lot of times it's, it's cytotoxic cell death. There is a high potential for uh, tumor necrosis syndrome. And so with these people, uh, we wind up giving one milligram subcutaneous to the person, they can do it at home, like five times a day. And that's a minimal kind of dose, but it's, a, it's enough. Ideally, you would give it to them really in slow amounts, low amounts, over eight to 12 hours, but no one's going to do that because it's got to be every day for a while. But people will get tumor necrosis, so it could actually, <coughs> it could actually preclude the need for many other therapies. But if you're adding it, you give the person the, 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 the uh, you get, they give them the peptide, they do it at home, it's, <coughs> and you can do a few at the office while you're at your office. Okay, and you just measure uric acid. You know, you look for, um, and, if, and if you start to see a rise in uric acid or any of the other signs of um, tumor necrosis syndrome, then you just slow down. That's all. Here's an <coughs> anti cancer peptide. The results indicate expressed in the membrane of non cell tumors. Here. Okay. GHK. Now, this is someone who can also look, not, you know, I didn't get a chance at all today to put in the body restructuring and uh, the beauty aspect of it because I just didn't get around to it because we're, we're already late. Um, but um, this GHK, the GHK um, CU actually, uh, has amazing utility in anti-aging. Um, what's the word? Uh, cosmesis, cosmetics. Uh, cracks go away and collagen increase and all that sort of thing. But, but so it protects skin cells from UV radiation. But it also suppresses RNA production in 70% of the 54 genes overexpressed in cancer patients. So it kind of resets, turns off the oncogenic. Um, model that has been established. So that's why I use that. And a side effect is they wind up looking beautiful. No established dose, 2.5 milligrams sub-Q three times a week. No one knows. Because they just there's not there's not money in, you know mitochondrial dysfunction underlies heart Heart failure, cancer, neurodegenerative process. We all know that cancer is a result of loss of mitochondrial function. If mitochondrial function is restored, cancer cells no longer ferment and are therefore no longer cancer cells. So one of the things that I learned in, in Japan when I studied with Dr. Uh, Kobayashi Tsuneo was uh, how to do a type of hyperthermia that lasts um, six hours. And you give certain IVs while you're doing it. Uh, the person is kept at a very strict 40.5 for that period of time. You're measuring cardiac, you're monitoring the cardiac uh, rhythm. You've got a central, um, you've got a rectal thermometer in. Anyway, um, what happens is at that temperature, it stimulates the production of heat shock proteins. And heat shock proteins in turn stimulate uh, mitochondrial proliferation. So Dr. Kobayashi had done biopsies of tumor cells uh, prior to treatment and then looked at them with an electron micrograph. And after treatment, did a biopsy and looked at them with an electron micrograph. And the difference was the, before the hyperthermia, the cell had very few and small shrunken down mitochondria. After the protocol, it was plush with big fat, healthy mitochondria. So in effect, since cancer is a metabolic condition, that is it lost its mitochondria, so it has to ferment in order to produce energy, it no longer has to ferment. Therefore, it's no longer cancer. It's pretty simple. It's called cancer reversal. Now, uh, to give him some credibility, um, uh, he meticulous records, 40 years, 45 years, 
over 40 years, and he's got meticulous records, 70% uh, of his patients have long-term uh, remission. He does more than just the hypothermia, but um, and I'll, and I and one day I'll have to talk about him because he's he's amazing, um, yeah. And, and by the way, we have to grab his we have to grab his mind before he dies. <laughs> but seventy percent reversal is a very 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 good percentage. Difficult to believe. Impossible to be, I mean, because I've worked with cancer and I can't imagine. Right. So 70% is like, especially we know that these patients reach uh, our doorsteps only when they've lost all hope from all other uh, sciences. Exactly. And then giving 70% rever reversal, I would definitely agree with you that, you know, we need to catch hold of his brains and learn. Yeah. I've studied with him. I've gone back and forth to Japan for the last... 25 years, you know, spending time with him and training with him. But, you know, he's at the point now where he's getting C now. Oh, by the way, can you see this? Yeah. That's the C link. So you take this off, you take that off, and then. Wow, great. Nice. I, I have one question for you, Dr. Thomas. Here is do you combine OGF and MENK MENK in cancer? Yeah. Well, no, they're the same. They're the same. They're different. They're the same. Right. Perfect. Great. So, um, anyway, so that's that's a, one of the things. It's great. So what, what what I like about this is if you um, can restore mitochondrial function. So, so I'm going to talk about a couple of mitochondrial peptides. But these peptides, understand, are important for somebody with anything, um, chronic fatigue. Um, aging, uh, anything, you know, the mitochondria are everything, right? So, right. Okay. So MOTC is producing the mitochondria in response to metabolic stress, diabetes, and insulin resistance. Okay. So during that time, uh, the, the mitochondria, it's a mitochondria peptide and it translocates to the nucleus of the cell, which then turns on all the antioxidant enzymes of the cell to block this, uh, the stress. Okay. So that's, what this does and of course we don't make a lot of it as we get older um so so the mitochondrial dna there are 37 genes two rna 22 trans, uh, trnas 13 polypeptides of union MOTC is a 16 amino acid peptide produced by mitochondria so and it, anyway it regulates the antioxidant response elements and you can see that there now the thing that's very uh, important about this is that longevity, exercise, diabetes, and cancer. Okay, so, all right, metabolic imbalance, right? Um, putative functions. It, it blocks. If, if this is increased, it blocks purine synthesis, which stimulates ACAR and AMPK, which also gets stimulated with exercise, which turns on PGC1 alpha, which then in turn stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis. Now, I know you're not going to believe it because I didn't, but one injection of this gives you the increase in APT, ATP production equivalent of six months of, um, uh, what's, the, what's the word? Hit training? Yeah, yeah, training, you know, like power. High, power. high, high intensity. High intensity training, yeah. And I so when I when I learned that from from the guy, the doctor at um at Taylor, Taylor made, I had to see that what he's talking about, and it's true. So and I'll I'll get that study to you, but that it's just pretty amazing. So um, anyway, it improves insulin sensitivity, protection against obesity, but it blocks ACAR. I mean, the, blocking the de novo purine synthesis allows ACAR, AMPK, uh, you know, which is AMP kinase, and all of this to go up, right? Aging stops this, right? So aging blocks this. So the MOTC is kind of critical in here. If you can do that, you can bypass it. So, but imagine doing that and exercising daily. Uh, so activation of AMPK has been found to oppose tumor progression in several cancer cell types. Hypoxia, hypoglycemia with exercise or fasting. 
and uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. That's what happens when, when the PGC1 alpha stimulates the mitochondrial biogenesis. So you're increasing the number of mitochondria you have. So five milligrams sub subcutaneously every other day or daily. Or some people do 10 milligrams three times a day. It depends on your, on your budget. So they say the maximum is uh, 20 milligrams a day. But Now. And for how many days? Well, uh, they say about six weeks, eight weeks. And then give it a break. Now this here is on the inner mitochondrial membrane, there's a folding in here. And uh, if you can see the orange here and the orange down here and the orange here, this is cardiolipin. Cardiolipin is a phospholipid that's produced only in the mitochondria. And it being here <clears throat> actually keeps this mitochondrial fold of the inner membrane tight. And it also right here in that place at the center is where the actual whole Krebs cycle goes on. And that's where all the ATP is produced. So as my, as, as uh, now cardiolipin has, is a, uh, has four phospholipid groups and they're all omega-6, not omega-3. They're all omega-6s. Anyway, they become oxidized as we age. And when they become oxidized, that fold in there starts to open up. And when it opens up, less and less uh, ATP are formed. Okay, so that's what that happens. So, so the inner mitochondrial membrane, mitochondrial contact site, ATP syn synthase is localized at the cardiolipin. It oxidizes with age. The curve gets looser and energy production decreased. Ah, this is the one. This is the one. Sorry, one injection, same as six months endurance endurance training. So SS thirty one uh, has a dimethyl dimethyl tyrosine residue, allowing it to scavenge uh, free radicals and inhibit linoleic acid oxidation. Because remember, we're talking about omega sixes, so linoleic acid. So it inhibits, uh, it, it blocks the peroxidation of those lipids, okay? So it binds to the cardiolipin like a glue, tightens the curve, and then you have better ATP production. So SS31 eliminates re, uh, reactive oxygen species, increases ATP production in mitochondria, thus maintaining membrane, mitochondrial membrane potential. Okay, so anyway, and then you know that this is for everything from neurodegenerative diseases, for everything. Everything. So the name of the, what, the, what they call it in, in addition to SS31 is a lamprotide, a lamprotide. No contraindications, no serious adverse events, mild aches or flatulence or abdominal pain with very high doses. Some have used 100 milligrams daily IV or 40 subcutaneous in, in clinical trials. One milligram daily is most widely used for people who have no problems, 10 milligrams per day for cancer. I, I, do, um, I do about 10 milligrams, four or five times a, a week. Now, <clears throat> this was a very, there's a very important because if you work with can, people with cancer, eventually you're gonna find someone that's gonna become cachexic. And uh, you know it's very difficult to treat cachexia because um, it just is. Usually they're not hungry either. Anyway, um, anyway they used oxaliplatin and, and 5-FU high doses to, to put um, mice into a state of cachexia. Um, Anyway, so what the conclusion was, the results suggest that targeting mitochondrial function may be as important as targeting protein anabolism. Yeah, so in other words, yeah, you need the protein. You gotta get protein into the body, right? Cause you gotta, you, you, you need that. But you also need the other nutrients and you need the energy. 
because the first job of all cells is to make enough energy just to maintain its shape, to maintain its sodium potassium pumps, to maintain its shape, then it can do any kind of work. So here it is, it, it prevented cisplatin-induced acute kidney injury by regulating mitochondrial uh, um, ROS. In conclusion, our study revealed that NLRP3 inflammasome might act as a pivotal regulator promoting the process of CPAKI. SS31 could reduce oxidative stress and apoptosis in these mice and therefore resist renal in injury, which might be due to the inhibition, inhibition activation of mitochondrial ROS. I hate science talk. Now, the last topic that's very important, because we're really out of time, um, is uh, cell cellular senescence. Mitochondrial peptides <coughs> can increase cellular senescence. Cellular senescence is also increased with chemotherapy. Cellular senescence is also increased with aging. Okay, so many things can trigger senescence. The problem with senescence is once the cell becomes, it's on pause, it's no longer functioning. It's just on pause, but it's not dead. It starts leaking anti-inflammatory uh, cytokines. It's called senescence-associated senescence secretory phenotype, SASP. Okay, it stimulates inflammatory cytokines. It's called inflammaging. And it underlies everything we see in aging from from uh, dementia to osteoporosis to everything, you name it, it's underlined by this. So we need synolytic therapies. So the senescent associated secretory phenotype, it pauses the, secret, the, the inflammatory cytokines, IL-1, IL-6, NF kappa beta, et cetera, are increased. As these increase with inflammation, low-grade chronic aging, you get atherosclerosis, fibrosis, osteoarthritis, and stem resistance, you get the whole you get the whole thing. Telomere erosion causes it, epigenetic factors, mitochondrial. So, so the risk for geriatric syndrome, in, uh, including frailty, immobility, mild cognitive impairments, and confidence. These conditions also cluster within individuals and are associated with age-related chronic diseases, blah, 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 blah. Fundamental aging processes include chronic, sterile, low-grade inflammation. By the way, and, and he, look at this. Here, they just transplanted a small number of senescent cells around a knee joint, and it caused osteoarthritis. Now, by the way, one of the most powerful anti-inflammatories is to eat uncooked food. Cooked food stimulates inflammation. Raw food does the opposite because it's not viewed by the body as being something that is unnatural and needs to be eliminated. You can look up that research by Dr. Luigi Fontana, MD, PhD at Washington University um, in, uh, where's that? Washington. I forget. Anyway, Luigi Fontana, MD, PhD. Everybody that was on raw food for three years or more consistently, whether they were 80 years old or 16 years old, had an undetectable CRP. So synolytic treatment, fisetin, rapamycin. Rapamycin is not really synolytic, it's uh, synostatic. Um, Metformin, quercetin, resveratrol, NMN, NAD+, that we talked about, the phospho DRI, and the 5-amino-1q. These are some of the synolytics, but it should be in, in any anybody who's aging, uh, who's having, especially having a symptomatic aging, or how about someone that doesn't want to age and they're not quite symptomatic? So the FOXO4 re, uh, relation to senescence, Fox, the FOXO4 uh, transcription factors have been shown to downstream effector molecules of IGF1. The absence of insulin and the PI3K is inactive. So the FOXO homolog is able to translate through the translate through blah, blah, blah. So what happens is basically that it um, it winds up um, blocking. This is a very similar to the PNC27 binding to the MDM2. 
This is very similar because it does the same thing. So in a cell, let me see if I can see right here. In a cell, where is that? Hmm. Okay, well, any, anyway, in a cell, you have the P53, and then you have the thing that puts the brakes onto the P53. Because the P53, which we know is a tumor suppressor, right, and, and, and it produces apoptosis, right? But if it was activated in all cells, it would cause apoptosis, we would, be, we would die. So we have this MDM2, uh, that count, kind of count, counteract it. It's like estrogen and progesterone, okay? So they, they counteract each other. So um, uh, what happens is the FOXO4 uh, uh, binds to the P53, which prevents it from being phosphorylated and it can be activated. Pretty cool. So, and again, remember we were talking about modifying peptides a little bit? So um, research on peptide chemistry usually is the natural L-peptide, okay? But the D amino acids are in re retro re reverse sequence. Modification of peptides to, to D retro inverso isoform can render peptides new chemical properties which may improve their potency. And that's exactly what the DRI is. So the FOXO4 can regulate expression of the P53 and through this activation uh, uh, wind up increasing and turning back on P53. You, if you worked with cancer, you know that one of the big problems with cancer is P53 being downregulated. It's like 50% of cancer and pr probably even more. So this is a big deal. But it also cleans up senescent cells. It gets rid of senescent cells. That's very, very important. So here's a study where they gave um, high doses of doxorubicin to these rats, and guess which one got the FOXO4 DRI? Yeah, his hair came back full, he grew, had good, okay, in other words, he didn't have the accumulation of senescent cells. So it counteracted the loss of renal function uh, in regular aging mice as well. So if you have someone with stage four renal cancer, definitely anybody with any aging problem or it's due to diabetes, it's due to a metabolic problem, the FOXO4 and the NMN and the, all the other, uh, I found a product here, Fisetin, Rapamide, Metformin, Quercetin, Risperin. I found a product online that is called, huh? I can't remember, but it's a fantastic combination of fisetin, quercetin, uh, whatever. It was like four or five of them. Uh, quercetin. It was and NMN. You know, it, it was pretty amazing. I gotta. I'll find it and I'll send it to to you so that you can share it with the group. Okay, but um, it's pretty amazing. I'm gonna I'm gonna order it myself and get it. Um, whoops. So I guess that's it. You know, I I, I apologize wow. again. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't organize this. I, I just did this all in one day. So no, thank you, Dr. Thomas. It was very, very informative, interesting, and very crisp and clear. I'm sure all the participants are feeling like, you know, when can we start using it? Right, right. Right. So I will uh, connect with you and take the contact numbers and speak to them how we can make it available in India. Also, we'll plan a few more sessions with you and the other guys you were recommending. Have an amazing time and let 2022 be the year of functional medicine in India and helping and healing people. Yes.